All right. Um, all right. Hello. So I'm going to go over at Coder Beginner Contest 374. Just going to go over all the problems from A to F. Um, just go over these. Uh, that's the first six. Um, and that's pretty much it. So let's look at the problems here. And I'll go, I'm probably going to go faster with the first few ones because they're, you know, they're rather simple. So this one is, um, this one's just ask you to find, um, if the string ends with san or san and print yes, otherwise print no. So yeah, I mean, you can do that many ways. Uh, how did I do it? I, I didn't see plus plus in Python. I know there's like easy ways. Um, okay, right. I uh, reversed the pattern and reversed the string, and then just found out um, if because the length of the pattern is three. Just find out if it all matches. Um, okay. This one unvarnished report and this one's just asking basically given two strings find the first uh character um that is different between the two strings so for this one the first character is different is the third character this this e and the c disagree this one it's different um only because the string is longer than this one and this one, they're never different, so you just print return zero. So, yeah, so that's pretty simple to code, just to, to, just a for loop, really, just looping through and just um, checking if you reach the end of a string or checking if the two characters are different. If we continue, we go to separate lunch. Yeah, so um, so for this problem, it's just asking that you can sign um the people to two groups, group A and group B. So this is like your group of people, or these are the departments and these are the number of people in each department. And basically you wanna, you wanna assign these to the two groups so that you minimize the maximum uh, number of people in a single group. So like for this one, the best option is to put um, three, uh have group b have five plus 10 and 15 people and have group a have two plus three plus 12 which is 17 people best one here is just like put one person in group a one person in group b and then here you, you kind of figure it out so um so uh, there may be um another solution to this but you can solve this basically by using um Treating as NP complete, I think is what is is what you call it. Um, so you can solve it in exponential time complexity because um, n is only up to twenty. So you can just pick. You can just solve it in taking the bit mask and um, and just checking if it's uh, equal. So like uh, like this right here. So just taking the total, accumulate the total across everything. Get your max answer and just iterate through every um, mask and then iterate through the mask and basically if the mask is set to one then that means you're picking that all, all the elements that are set to a one are all in the same group and the other everything is set to zero is in the other group so your bit mass is just representing um because you're you're in a, it's binary you're either in group a or group b so it's a binary so zero presents being group one a one represents being group B. So an integer can represent the binary. 
So iterating over this math, like the first one is zero, where everything's zero. And in that case, everything's in, in one group. Uh, and you just accumulate the sum and then take total minus sum. So, you know, whatever the sum is in one group, you know, the total sum of, of every one, the other group will be just total minus the sum, right? Um, and then you just minimize this answer across the board. Okay. Okay, now we get to where it gets a little complicated laser marking. Yeah, <laughs> I spent a little too much time on this one in the um, when I solved it just because um, I wasn't paying attention to what I needed to actually calculate. Happens sometimes. Um, but essentially, for this one, uh, you move the laser position to one of the endpoints of the line segment and you start drawing from either endpoint. So instead of just going through all this wall of text, um, I'll just point out the key points, um, which is that. When not emitting the laser, the laser position can move in any direction at a speed of s units. So there's a speed of the laser when you're not emitting, and then there's a different speed of the of the laser when you are emitting the laser. And basically, you want to emit the laser along each line segment. So when you're given this example, you're given a one three to two one and zero two to zero zero and three zero. So best way to do this is just draw it so given okay so given a grid here Like so. So one of the endpoints is at one three. Oh, hold on. I think I did that wrong. I'm uh, sorry. One of the endpoints is at one three. And two one. So you have a line segment here. You have a line segment from. 0 2 to here. So you have a line segment along this. You have a line segment from here to here. Okay, I'm going to change the color for the line segments. So you have a line segment here, and a line segment here, and a line segment here. So you need to have the laser emit at these locations. So to, to solve this problem, you want to minimize the total amount of time that it takes. Um, that's what it wants you to return. The minimum seconds required to complete printing all the line segments. So complete, complete printing all the line segments. So for instance, I could start my laser. Well, I think your laser always starts. It says in the problem, your laser always starts here at the origins. So if I start my laser here, I could turn on the laser and then move upwards and and get and do this first one here and just have the laser on as I run up to the end point from this end point to that end point. And then I move the laser over to this one. And then I could turn on the, the laser as I go down here. And then I can move here, my move my laser to this position and then turn on the laser and scan um, here. So that might be one of the optimal ways to minimize the amount of total time to scan. Um, so, and the other as aspect here is that, um, uh, let me go back to the problem. You give an S and T, and you're guaranteed that T is always less than or equal to S. Um, So 
So S is the time is the speed. Okay. So S is the speed. So that means it's distance per time for, and then the other one is also going to be uh, distance per time. But um, it says T is always less than S. S is the time when you're not emitting the laser. So it's, it's the, it's the, it's how fast I can move when I'm moving from like here to here from these two points. Cause I can't, I'm not going to emit the laser during here. Um, but when I'm moving from like here to here, I'm emitting the laser. So this is taking me T and this is taking me S time or S this is the speed, not the time. This is the speed it takes. So the time that's one thing you need to figure out here is how you're going to actually calculate the time. So if I'm moving from a position to another position, um, I have the distance traveled, right? So given uh, the start coordinates and whatever the end coordinates are, I can find the distance. And if I know the distance, I can say that um, I know the speed. So let's say d over t. I want to solve for t. Well, that's going to be equal to the distance divided by the speed. OK, so that we're going to use that to calculate the actual time. So really, to find the minimum of time, um, there's only going to be at most six of these strings, of these line segments. So really, what you can do is you can just permutation you just try every possible configuration and calculate the amount of time it would take so every possible configuration is basically this you're going to have n factorial permutation so you try every permutation um, that represents the order in which you like the order in which you process these so if this is my first second and third line seg segment I could do one, two, three, or I could do three, two, one, and so on. That's the order in which I the order in which I draw the line segment with the printer. So you try every possible ordering um, of drawing the line segments. Um, in total, there'll be n factorial of those. In addition to doing that, there's one more thing you want to do is that whenever you're choosing to draw a line segment, you have to choose one of the endpoints to start. So we would just say, what's my endpoint I'm going to start on? Where for each of the n, I have two to the n possibilities. That is 0, 0. Like I represent it with this as this binary. So this, what this means, if it's a 0, it means you start with um, like, like each of these line segments is, are defined by these like coordinates. And if it's 0, let's say you're going to start from the um, whatever the uh, these coordinates, but if it's a one, you're going to start from these coordinates. So you can have it, you know, so if it's a zero, you start from this coordinate. If it's a one, you start from this coordinate. So trying every possibility, you're going to try every, like, um, starting from each endpoint as well. So then basically what you have here is you have, like, something where, like, you have, an, you have a, the laser, it's on, it's emitting, it's mapping out this um, this line segment. Okay, I turn the laser off. Now I'm going to switch over and start moving to the next the next line segment over to here. And then once I then I'm going to say starting from this endpoint, I'm going to turn on the laser and I'm going to draw this line segment. And then I turn the laser off and then I move down here. And then maybe I turn on the laser again, and then I map out this line segment. And in the problem, it says line segments can overlap. If line segments overlap, you treat them as separate. So if I have two line segments here, one there, and then one here, I'm going to have to do this part here two times. I have to do it for each individual line segment, which just simplifies the solution. So that's basically what I remember of the solution. Um, so you kind of just, uh, here's what the code would look like. So you can, you can represent your points. Um, and then you can represent the lines as being a point to a point. Um, and then here you're going to calculate the Euclidean distance. distance. 
I'm using the long double. Um, which should give me the 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 amount of precision that I need. Um, <clears throat> so it builds the lines. Um, construct the indices here and then fill them in with iota. So it fills in indices from zero to n minus one. And really, you use this for your permutation for determining the order of the lines. So then it just does this do while loop. Um, and goes through each permutation, and then it goes through each possible mask. And again, the mask just represents like which point you start from in the the line. So are you going to start from this one? If it's a zero, it starts from this one. If it's a one, it starts from this endpoint. So it tries every single configuration, and then you're going to minimize on the answer. So in the calculation step, it's going to you always start from the origin coordinates, and then you get your your P1, your P2, if the mass is set to one, then you swap your P1 and P2. That's when you wanna swap your endpoints. And then you just calculate the Euclidean distance to go from your current coordinates to the start of the line that you want to draw. And then this is the distance to draw the line. And then you calculate this by taking D1 divided by S. So this will give you the time, because this is the speed and this is the distance. This is the time to get your laser into position to seek to get to a position and then this is the time to actually draw the line segment um and then yeah and you keep adding up and then you update where your x and y coordinate are which will be at the end of the line segment okay so hopefully that one's clear um, i'm gonna move on to so um i'm gonna do this in reverse i think um i'm gonna do well i'm gonna do e last i think e is actually the hardest one to discuss so i think i'm gonna do shipping first um this one uh, i think this one's easier to discuss and go over um Basically, for this one, I don't know. I, I don't know why I struggled on it, but um, it's essentially a dynamic programming problem. Um, you know, you spend your time reading through it. And most K orders can be shipped together. Order I can only be shipped on day I. Actually, hold on. Okay, let me get back to where I was. Uh, uh, okay, so for this problem, if I summarize it, um, essentially, um, you can make these shipments. Uh, whenever you choose to make a shipment, you can only include uh, up to some number. They say K. You can only include up to K at most K orders in a single shipment. So... You have this concept of shipments, but you can only have so a set number of orders in the shipment. But and then you have for each order, an order can only be shipped after some set day. So you're, there's a there's like you can't ship something until some day, you know. So you can't like just instantly ship it. But also, whenever you make a shipment, you cannot make another shipment until X days later. Um, and, and the other thing is that when an order is placed and it's not shipped, each day that it's not shipped, the dissatisfaction accumulates by one. So if I order a day, so they say here, if you order, if order I is shipped on day SI, this, and um, it became available, or the order was made on day TI, but it was shipped on SI, you take the difference between them. You want to find the minimum possible total dissatisfaction accumulated 
over all orders if you optimally schedule the shipping dates. And you can look here, K and N are less than or equal to 100. And then it also says that for each of the orders, the orders are given in the uh, in the ascending order or increasing order of time it was placed, the time at which it was, the order was placed. Uh, the time here is day, I suppose. So this is the day it was placed. Um, It is faster just to erase all this, but <clears throat> basically, I'm just going to draw like uh, some visualizations that may make it easier to kind of get an idea of what you want to do. Um, one aspect that I'm thinking is, yep, okay. Uh, yes, I was like, that was crazy. Okay, it won't let me delete that. Can I delete this? There you go. Very well. So this is how I view this problem. You have a number line and then you have some days um when an order becomes available so it's like order one Oop. <sighs> what? Mm, it's doing this again i have like Order two, order three, order four, order five, order six or something. So <clears throat> how I kind of think of it is, um, is if I'm at some uh, day here, let's say I'm at this, this day or this order day. On this day in the number line, I can ship, these are the orders that can be shipped, 01, 02, and 03. All of these orders can be shipped on this day. Um, so, so yeah, uh, all of these orders can be shipped on this day. So what I kind of think of it like is these are like events. These are like events along a timeline. So it's like a um, – it's kind of similar to a um, – <laughs> hmm. Well, if you, um, you know you want to ship something as kind of as soon as you can. So you're, if K is large enough, you know, K may be large enough to where you can ship all of these orders. And, you know, it kind of depends. Is it best to wait? to ship them or is it not best to wait? So I kind of figure it is you say how many you 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 you're gonna have a DP state where you have you're at this time stamp right here or this is like an event index 
and then you can say like um how many orders have i shipped what was the last order shipped and you kind of think these might be useful states for the the, the dp solution and um and then what you can do at so at event i um at event i i can keep increasing the last order shipped so so yeah so coming from this state here <clears throat> so let's say let's say the last order is j okay but let's put, make these concrete let's say i is three and j is zero so then last order i shipped was like was a zero which means i haven't ordered let's say this means the um this means that i haven't shipped any orders so ah uh, okay so maybe this isn't the last order shipped maybe this is the next order that can be shipped mm, yeah um so then at j equals zero i can ship order o1 but i'm gonna take i need it to, to calculate the dissatisfaction so dissatisfaction will, will increment based on um whatever the current time is for event i so I don't know what the time is for event I is, but subtracted by the time at which I guess event uh, event. Um, but there's, there's going to be something here because I haven't got to it yet. But um, but this is like yeah. Let's say this is event J. So dissatisfaction will be increased based on this difference because basically I'm saying that I'm I'm adding this order, like if this is one, I'm adding this order to when this is the third event. I'm, I'm making a shipment right now. And when I do that, I'm going to be putting this into a new DP state where it's going to be three uh, and... It's going to be one, and then it's going to be equal to whatever the current dissatisfaction is, and then if I that's if I add order O one. If I add order O two into it, then I'm going to be updating. Oops, three here. I'm going to be updating this state to whatever the current dissatisfaction is, which will be accumulated. So it would it would have calculated it would have um here. Let's just say a uh, dissatisfaction here would be some prior previous value plus um the o3 minus o1 sure let's say those are and then this one would be some prior and it's going to be o3 minus o1 plus o3 minus o2 and then you can also if you can include depending on how many items you can include in the shipment if you can include three items into your shipment then you can go one more and go here um, and go plus O3 minus O1 plus O3 minus O2 plus O3 minus O3. That's if you go one more. Um, and, and this is just coming from the last order being J. So it could, there's like multiple states, but I'm just going to kind of draw the transition here. So I'm going to say, here's the transitions. So transitions are, first off, you're kind of doing a DP push. A DP push makes the most sense to me for this problem. Um, so what I mean is like, you're going to say DPI, you're going to push to the next event. Oh, there's one more thing you, you do need to consider before you do this. Um, before you get to this point, uh, one more thing you need to consider, which is that 
the events aren't just going to be the time stamps where you make an order. These are not just going to be the events. You have more events. So what, are the, what I mean by that is when you make a shipment, you make a shipment at a time. Like I make a shipment at 01. When I make a shipment at 01, that then opens availability. I can make another shipment. You have there. There's a certain um, amount of time you have to wait between shipments. So that amount of time I have to wait between shipments. Uh, you can use that here. You can say that. Um, you're gonna you want to use that to make events. Like these are these are not going to be your only events. And I I guess the best example is the use example they gave. So they have one, two. Uh, what was their example? Oh, this one right here. Okay, I'm gonna use this example. And so the time between shipments is three. Okay. Okay, so time between shipments is three. So you can make a shipment. You can make your first shipment at t equal one. Right? You can't make a shipment before then. Um, if you make a shipment at t equals one, when can you next make a shipment? You can make your next shipment at t equals four because you just have to wait three seconds between. So then you can make another shipment at t equals four. So we're just going to make that an event. Now I know that t equals four, there's not going to be another order ready, but in the problem, you'll handle that. You'll handle the fact that maybe there's no order that is actually ready right now. But just kind of build it up like this because at the five, six one, you can make because it's very important for the 561. If you make a shipment at t equals 5, then the next time you can make a shipment will be at 3 seconds later, so it's t equals 8. So if you ship this fifth one, you can't ship the sixth one until t equals 8. Um, and then you can make your shipment there. So you're going to actually build up all the events based on like every distance outside of it. Um, so in total, what this means is that for one, from the first event, I'm going to create all of these events. I'm going to create a one, four, I'm just going to add three to each one, a seven, a 10, a 13, um, a 16. I mean, you stop it at some point. Um, you stop it basically at the point of how many items are. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, you uh, you won't have to go beyond this one. Um, is that is that what I did? Yeah, that's what I did. Um. So this is a bit of code that I did where it multiplies by that. So yeah, you kind of construct these events, but you do it for each one. So this is for the one, then you're going to do it for the five, and and you're going to do it for the six, and so on and so on. And you know, and you'll do it for the ten. So the ten will go all the way um, out further. Um, but you can see there's overlap here with the ten and the thirteen. So you're going to remove duplicates. Uh, but yeah, if you think about this, doing that will create, well, first off, the time complexity is only over and squared, so it's fast enough. It's also only over and squared. You're only going to have, at most, n squared events. Again, there's two different types of events. I'm going to say it again. There's an event where there's an order at that event, or multiple orders, at least one order. Or there's events where there's no orders. It's just representative of an of an event where you may want to make a shipment. Um, so given that, now I'm going to look at the transitions. And in a DP push uh, kind of algorithm, 
Uh, okay, so the transitions that you might be interested in would be um, the first option. If I'm at event I, I can choose to do nothing, to not make a shipment. And if I do that, then whatever the current um, the current dissatisfaction, it's going to be the same uh, for the next event. So again, this represents the next event, and this represents um, the amount of orders, or this this represents the index of the next order that needs to be shipped. The it represents the index of the 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 next order that has not been shipped. Um, and just to say, like, uh, I guess I didn't say this. I assumed it. You always want to ship the order that is the oldest one first. It's always beneficial to do that because that's one that's going to give you the most dissatisfaction. Um, so you're going to want to ship that one. Um, but yeah, you can just update it like this. And this is just a very simple thing. This is basically saying you do not make a shipment. So another possibility is you start making shipments. Um, so, um, so you kind of go through this thing. Now, when you're making a shipment, um, so this would be make shipment at uh, right. <clears throat> Um, make shipment if you can. So first off, you have to make sure you limit it to K shipments. And then what you'll do is you're going to update the event. Um... So you'll say DP. So what are you going to put here for the event? I'm just going to put next for now. I'll, I'll say how you calculate it in a minute. And then you're going to... Uh, be some... I think... K plus one equals a DP, and then it's whatever your current event is, your last order, plus um, you're going to accumulate your accumulated dissatisfaction. So... You're going to be accumulating dissatisfaction for each event you process. So if I have, if I process uh, one order, I process the one order, so it'll be, it'll be the jth order. So you'll update the satisfaction. You'll update or the dissatisfaction. And then your this k plus 1 will be actually j plus one and if you process two orders then you're going to be doing j plus two and so on um and your accumulated dissatisfaction will be incremented based on the dissatisfaction accumulated on by process two and then um this next variable represents the in next event where you can make a shipment so for that you just need to um, you just need to like increment next. So you're gonna have some next variable equal to I guess event I originally, and then you increment this um, until up to the point where like it's at least x away, you know. So at least like um, that. Uh, I don't know if I'm explaining that well, but. Here's what it looks like in the code. So this is what I meant by you sort the events and you 
let me take the unique events. <clears throat> and you build a D you will build a DB based on the events and the orders, um, starting with zero and then this next. So what I want to look at is, in particular is um oh I guess it's this part. So um you for each event you process the next the next represents if you make a shipment at this event this is the next index you can the next event in which you can make a shipment so you really just got to keep increment impl, incrementing it until this is no longer less than the time of the current event plus x um and then here you go through j equals zero all the way to n so that just means that that's just iterating through like what's the next order that you're going to place um and then starting from that order if it's infinity that means it's, that state's not impossible that state's impossible and this is a push where basically you're saying that um i'm not going to do a shipment so i'm just going to keep it the same i'm moving to the next event but i'm not making a shipment okay if you decide to make a shipment starting from having this be the next uh, uh order that needs to be shipped you're going to start accumulating your dissatisfaction and you, you create this variable in and you make sure you can only increment at most up to k because you only have k in the shipment um, and then you also make sure the position is not is less than or equal to events i so you know um, and then you increment the dissatisfaction and then you do this here where you yeah um this is where you like just update based on the next and n plus one and you just kind of update this adding the, the accumulated dissatisfaction um this one is like if you if it's equal to the end event you just need to add it to, you need to update the answer and you want to get the minimum answer um if it's like if it's like this means that all orders have been shipped okay that's basically that one all right i guess we'll do the next one <clears throat> okay yeah so this is the last one so this is e um see if i can remember um this one yeah so this one using dp push i feel like made this one easier um instead of thinking about doing it a different way. All right, I'm gonna make sure I'm on good on time. Okay, I do wanna go through this one at least fast enough. <clears throat> So this one, you're manufacturing a certain product and requires n processes. And essentially for each process, um, there are two types of machines that are available to, to handle it. So, you know, you could use machine SI and that can process AI products per day, per, per unit, per day per unit and causes PIN per unit. Or you could choose machine TI and that can process BI. So yeah, you have like two options for each one. Um, for each process, you have two machines to choose from. You can purchase any number of each machine, machine, possibly zero. Suppose that process I can handle WI products per day as a result of introducing machines. So you want to define the, product, the production capacity as the minimum W. So like I have all my machines, but the minimum amount of products I'm getting per day for one of the processes is two, and all the other ones are greater than two. Um, they're producing more than two products per day. But this one particular process is only producing two products per day. So that is the minimum. So that would be the production capacity. Um, and then given the total budget of X, find the minimum achievable production capacity. 
So, I uh, sorry, not the minimum, <laughs> the maximum production capacity. So, yeah, you can do that by um, by using binary search. Like the first thing I kind of think of for this one is binary search. Because you can just, um, you know, you can like, um, you kind of want to search for the production capacity, and you you can binary search that production capacity, because you want to maximize it. So you can say, can I achieve this amount of production capacity given how much yen I have and given the machines that I have? Can I achieve this production capacity? And then it will go through and it will see if it can achieve it based on some greedy algorithm. So we need some kind of greedy algorithm where we can, where we know we're, we're minimizing the costs and maximizing the number of products for each process. So I kind of just want to go through there. So you, I'm kind of thinking, okay, I'm going to binary search on the production capacity. And if it's impossible, I use that to update my search base because if it's impossible to achieve some value, then it's impossible to achieve anything greater than that. Um, if it's possible to achieve a value, then it's, you know you could achieve something um, more than that. So here's what I mean. I'm just going to do a, a bit of motivation for the binary search initially here. So say this is my binary, this is my search space. For my for my algorithm for the production capacity and we're guessing right now that the production capacity is this value let's label it m and so let's say that this is not achievable so let's say it's it's not achievable it not achievable just means that with with x n i cannot possibly um even with x n i cannot possibly get all processes to create M, uh, like basically I can't achieve in production capacity. If this is impossible, then anything over here is also impossible. I can't achieve, if I can't achieve that, I can't achieve anything greater than it because those are just going to cost more yen. Um, well, um, so all of this is impossible. So you can, you don't need to search over here and you can just search uh, in this left segment. Um, if M was possible, then that means it's possible over here, and it, you, it's possible up to here. You don't know where, so then you're going to search into this segment. Um, so that's what I mean. So you can binary search the production capacity. Now, given that, that's, gonna, that's good because you have a log factor there. But so how can you calculate the, the maximum production capacity given uh sorry so given a production capacity right because we're, bi we're binary searching this so given a fixed production capacity uh p how can we achieve this across our processes using the minimum amount of yen so we're going to try to achieve it so we're going to try to achieve uh, achieve p products for each process. So I could have three processes. I have process one, two, and three. And so across all of these processes, I want to achieve P products um, because that's my current production capacity. So I want to do that as cheap as possible. So now the question breaks down to given, given a process or reduces to, sorry, given a process, um, given a process, PI and production capacity okay that's really bad um p maybe i should think that um so you have two machines you can pick si and ti and one will produce 
A products at some cost um, are uh, let's just label it slightly different. So let's say this one this one will produce P S products at cost like this, and this will produce these products at cost T. Let's just say. And so, like one thing you can think of really quickly is um, is that I'm able to. This is my cost, and this is my products. I'm able to produce per day. If I take um, this thing here and I divide it by this, I'm calculating. Uh, I'm calculating the. Uh, hold on. Okay, hold on. Um, right, because this could be the cost is something here, and there's how many products I can produce based on this cost. So this is just the number of products over the cost. So this is just kind of giving you how many products I can get. Uh, you know, this is kind of giving you the rate per product, I think. Actually, what you want, I think, is CS over PS, which gives you the cost per product. Right? Yeah, that's what you want. So essentially, this value is useful because if CS over PS is less than this one, um, it makes sense to use this to produce your, to get your production capacity because it's cheaper. Right, it's this product is technically cheaper. The cost per product is cheaper. So okay, I it makes most sense to just um, produce this product. But there is a problem with that um, because you're not allowed to take fractional amounts. So it's possible that like um, that this one's cheaper, and I pick it, and it takes up some like let's say. We're trying to achieve this production capacity, and so I pick, I pick this, I pick one of these, right? And it, and it produces this number of products, and then I pick a second one, it produces this number of products, and I pick a third one, it produces this number of products. Let's say, like all of these are basically PS um, products being added. Then I pick it one more time, but it's going to kind of overshot. It's going to overshoot the production capacity. Um, it's just unavoidable. Just picking this one because I can't pick a fraction. I got to pick the whole item. So it can overshoot the actual production capacity you need. So then you're kind of paying extra for all of this remaining bit. When sometimes maybe you could do this instead. You could pick this one, this one, and then you could pick maybe PT, which might be more expensive, but it doesn't overshoot it as much. So it actually saves you money. Um, so my first solution really was that I just had to consider taking the the item that's the 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 the, the one that's more cost efficient, taking that one all the way up until it overshots, and then basically consider the other option being that you remove the overshooting one and you instead take the less cost efficient one and try to fill it in with that one. That was my initial assumption. But that solution didn't pass. Um, and then I just thought, um, let me show my solution here. <clears throat> um, so I read in everything. I have this selling function. This is this is the binary search here. So you go high to infinity. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the details here. But um, infinity, by the way, is a billion. So yeah, the answer is not going to be above a billion. Um, and it just checks if it's possible, and this is, this is the binary search logic. Checking if it's possible, it's going to calculate the cost, and basically calculating the cost from candidate one and candidate two. 
um which is okay so for me i don't actually like look into which one's more cost effective i'm assuming one is more cost effective so can it one can it two can it one assumes that product one that this product is the one that's more cost efficient that's what it kind of assumes and this one assumes that the other one so like i try both because it doesn't really matter and i just take the minimum one and then in here then this is an a p so okay so the a is the more cost efficient one so you can think of it as in you fill in in with a but how much are you going to take of the least cost efficient so what i do is i say at most i won't i don't want to take very much of the the one that's least cost efficient so i just iterate up to a thousand i just thought because in the example the thing that i was wrong about initially was that it's not the case that you're always gonna just take one of the of the of the machine that is um, less cost efficient. It could end up that you actually take more than one, but um, it doesn't make sense that you would take that many. You're gonna take some maximum amount. So I thought, well, okay, just limit to a thousand because I knew that wouldn't time limit. That would that would satisfy within the time constraints. Um, so just take up to that, and then it just fills in this least cost efficient one, and then you take for the rest of it, you take the one that's more cost efficient, and then you just kind of um, calculate the value and get the minimum among these. So okay, <clears throat> now I'm going to go into the proof of why it's the case that you only need to take up to a small number of the one that's least cost efficient. So here's a proof for it that I found out. <laughs> See if I can do this. So, so here's what here's here's what I'm gonna state. Let's say you have the um, I'm gonna say a a is the the products per day for the cost efficient one, and b is the one that's not cost efficient. So, I don't know. Or just say less cost efficient. So this one's more cost efficient. So you, you think you mostly want to take A, but you're going to want to take some B. The argument here is that you're going to take at most max of A, B, of the cost Let's just, let's just say cost inefficient one, inefficient. Um, machine. That is, you'll take that many machines of it. Um, so, so why would this be the case? And so remember, A, A and B are less than 100. So that means I iterate up to 1,000, but actually it only had to go up to 100. Um, let's 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 try to draw an example here, um, and and and, and um, illustrate this a bit more. <clears throat> so let's say a is three, and let's say b is or uh, let's say a is ten, and b is three. So this produces 10 products, this produces three products. But A is more cost efficient. But let's say our target is, um, let's say our target is like 10. Okay, it's obvious you're gonna pick A equals 10. Right? You're gonna pick the more cost efficient one instead of picking, you have to pick four of these. Um, but let's draw an argument here. Um, let's say pose for a minute that let's suppose for a minute I pick 10 of these the one that's less cost efficient let's say I pick 10 so think about 10 is the max 
the max of 10 and 3 is equal to 10, right? So I pick 10 of the one that of the one that produces B. Okay. So let's say the cost of that cost of B is multiplied by 10 and the production is 3 times 10 so I produce 30 units and then this is the cost okay Well, you could easily produce 30 units using this product, and that would be 3 multiplied by this cost. And that would be like, I guess, 10 times 3. And that would produce 30 units as well. But um, this one's more cost efficient. So it's better to do this for your 30 units. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, it, let's say you pick... Um, so but the point of what this is trying to show is that if you pick enough of this one where basically it's equal to however many products are produced from this one then you can just replace it with this so if i overshoot it um darn i'm not thinking i, I can't remember the exact like the thought i had that made this like really make sense last time um but yeah it is essentially something like this is the reason why. Like you could pick you could pick two of B it just gives you six. And then you could also, instead of doing this, you could choose to pick, I guess, one of A, which produces 10. So it, like, overshoots it. So even though B is not as cost efficient, it may be better in this, in this scenario picking just the two. If you pick three of B, it could also be better. Uh, I highly doubt it, but it could be better than 1 times 10. But if you pick four... Then you're picking four times three, which means you're producing 12 units. You would have another option where you could just produce, you could produce 12 units that way, or you could produce 12 units by doing, or, or you, if you need to produce 12 units, you could also produce 12 units by doing this. And then one times three, it's actually going to overshoot it by one. But um, you could swap it out for this one. But the, I guess the argument here is that you would never go over the max of A and B. Because if you go over the max, um, for instance, like let's say if you go over the max ever. So if I picked 12, right, let's say I picked 12 of 3. And I picked 0 of 10. That's going to produce 36 units. But just like, but here's the thing. Um, a number in here is divisible by 10. Right? I can trade. I could trade 10 of these for three of these. 
and then I would just do this. I would still produce 26 units, or sorry, 36 units, but I'm using the more cost efficient one over here. And I guess that's kind of what it is. It's kind of like a, I don't know, it's hard to make this argument, but, um, but it's something like this um, for why you do it only up to 100. But yeah, that's the key to solving it. Um, and that's, that's it for now. Uh, so until next time.